Katharina is working with um, Matthew Dyer and Vitaly Curlin at, um, at Liverpool, University of Liverpool, uh, and she's in, been interested in, in more generative model type work, but the project title is Machine Learning Identification of Co-Crystal Formation. So let's find out whether we're still on that particular path. Okay, so over to you, Katharina. No. Okay. Uh, hello from Liverpool. Uh, I am uh, going to talk to you. I'm, I'm currently uh, starting this, the third year of my PhD uh, and I'm going to give you an overview uh, about uh, my project uh, so far. Uh, so my project uh, is about um, how we can use uh, the CSD dat database and uh, some machine learning uh, for uh, discover uh, new co-crystals. So I will start by explaining uh, what is a co-crystal. Uh, so co-crystals uh, are basically a combination of two of more different molecules uh, that are uh, combined in, uh, with different non-covalent uh, interactions, such as hydrogen bonding uh, or pi pi stacking. So they are very important uh, for a uh, pharmaceutical industry uh, because they can preserve the properties uh, of the active pharmaceutical ingredient whilst the physical, physical chemical properties of the drug uh, remain uh, unchangeable. Um, although uh, they are very important for, for drugs and pharma, uh, their uh, applications are not only limited uh, to, to them. Uh, so current research has shown that co-crystals can be very useful as um, electronic materials. So everybody knows that uh, the most organic crystals uh, are insulators. However, there are some uh, type of molecules that have uh, rich pi orbitals and uh, they can form a pi pi stacking uh, and in that stacking they can exchange electrons and we have some um, el el electrical current. Uh, so this type of molecules uh, are known um, as polyaromatic hydrocarbons uh, and are electron-rich electron molecules uh, that de demonstrate good properties and they also they can also be very good candidates uh, for co-crystallization. So the, most of the co-crystals uh, in that category uh, have either C60 uh, or TCNQ as one of the co-formers. Uh, and they are reported uh, with um, superconductivity or other um, uh, important electronic properties. Uh, although this category of um, electronic uh, co-crystals with electronic applications uh, is very um, it's very important and the chemistry behind is very interesting. Um, it is not really easy to predict uh, the information uh, or either with experimental screening uh, or to apply some computational modeling uh, because of the fact that there are no uh, strong direction bonding to connect them. So uh, we claim that using data uh, that exists in CSD, uh, we are able to do some uh, uh, predictions uh, about uh, proper pairs of polyaromatic hydrocarbons. And I will show you, so, um, so how can we use data uh, to, to, for predict, for, for, to, to do predictions? So if you have a look in the evolution of chemistry, uh, so initially, um, the science was based, uh, was empirical. So it was the current experimental work workflow as we know. Uh, then um, the mathematics came and we can describe uh, some physical uh, um, processes with math mathematical models. Later on, uh, we have the computers uh, and we can uh, do simulations and solve more complex equations. And nowadays, uh, we are uh, on the era of uh, big data and uh, we, can, we want to use uh, all the data from the previous paradigms and try to extract knowledge of them and produce new knowledge. Uh, of course, AI didn't came to substitute the previous methods, but uh, just uh, to find the best ways uh, to, to use them uh, for go further the science. So all these uh, parts um, we try to incorporate in my project so far. Uh, so my project uh, is basically uh, can be basically separated into four different parts. Uh, so the first part uh, is the database analysis, uh, then the machine learning part. Then we have when we have some predictions, uh, we want to find the optimal uh, combinations uh, to use uh, for the lab, and then we go to the lab and try uh, these optimal combinations. So I'm going to uh, talk in more detail for each of these parts during my talk. 
So the, for the first part, uh, the database analysis, uh, we uh, it, it is very for any machine learning model. It is very important the data uh, we feed them with. Uh, so the existence of uh, reliable and complete databases uh, is really important. Uh, so the two databases we used for my work uh, is uh, the Cambridge Structure Database uh, for extracting uh, all, all the known polyaromatic uh, hydrocarbon co-crystals uh, that exist, starting from some uh, initial pines with distinct uh, electronic properties and structure. And we try to find uh, all the combinations that involve either these molecules or molecules that are structurally similar to them. So we made uh, our one data set with all the known uh, molecular pairs of co-crystals. Uh, the second database we used uh, is the Zinc-15, uh, which is a um, database uh, that contains all the purchasable molecules that we can have. So we started again searching for uh, pies starting from uh, the same initial ones uh, to construct a second list with all the possible pairs that we, we could try on the lab. So we have two data sets, one with the known data and one with all the possible uh, pairs of, that, that might form co-crystals. Uh, so after having uh, our two data sets, then we need to find uh, which is the best machine learning method uh, to use for them. And uh, so if we define the problem that we have at hand uh, is that we have a complete data set with known and another one with all the possible pairs, but not a data set uh, with uh, negative results. So we have no information uh, about the pairs that cannot exist. Uh, so our data sets are quite imbalanced because they're based only on positive data. Uh, and also, um, the most of machine learning algorithms does not have any chemical understanding. So we don't know why uh, they gave that predictions uh, because they are regarded uh, as black boxes. So these are the problems uh, we tried to deal with uh, for applying machine, machine learning. Uh, so we thought to uh, use a method called uh, one class classification, uh, which is a quite simple concept. So um, I can explain simple with uh, apples and pears. Uh, so binary classifiers uh, usually try to try to separate um, one apple uh, the apples of, peer, of peers, one category uh, from another. Uh, but then, if we give a fake peer, a fake, a fake apple, it will be categorized uh, as a peer, as a as a peer, not as an apple, because of the binary classifier. So what the one class classifier is doing is doesn't care about uh, the two different categories. It's just trying to find where the majority or the density. Uh, of data uh, lay into, and then uh, try to fit a threshold around which uh, all the known data uh, can exist. So if we apply this concept to co-crystals, instead of trying to find uh, work, uh, pairs that work and pairs that do not work, we just try to focus only uh, in the area where the known co-crystals are, and then try to see if a new pair uh, of um, possible molecules can be found in the same cluster uh, as well with the known ones. So um, the, we, the overview of uh, the framework of uh, well, the one-class classification framework uh, is shown here. Uh, we start. We extracted uh, the molecular representations of uh, the pairs using the dragon descriptors. And then we applied uh, some classical machine learning techniques uh, and then some deep learning techniques. So we should note that for the classical ML, uh, we needed to do some uh, quite a lot of feature engineering as well to reduce the dimensionality of our data uh, for have uh, better predictions. So after that, uh, we compared all the models together and we selected the best one uh, to try to interpret the predictions to get some physical meaning uh, about why this, the model gave these predictions and then continue further with um, the laboratory work. Uh, so the standard uh, one class algorithms, uh, we used uh, eight different algorithms that each one of them has different concepts. So some are uh, tree based, uh, some other are the one class uh, SVM uh, or uh, autoencoders. Uh, so and the feature engineering was performed um, based on the correlations between the features of the molecules. So we tried to select uh, only the features that uh, are highly correlated uh, among the molecular pairs. Uh, 
and uh, we also tried to train our models uh, in a bi-directional way uh, so that it will understand that either if you have uh, molecule one and molecule two or molecule two and molecule one it will be the same thing because they are uh, order invariant the pairs and uh, at the end we get a scoring from zero to one uh, according to how uh, good a combination a new combination might might be uh, the deep one class architecture is quite similar but uh, instead of uh, feature engineering uh, we used an attention based autoencoder uh, which was able to extract uh, to perceive the invariance between the pairs so that the pairs are equivalent and then we connected that uh, to a fit forward uh, neural network uh, aiming for uh, one class classification and uh, that again gave a score from zero to one uh, so we wanted to check which of these methodologies is better and uh, so in italy we we ha had a look uh, on the scores so how it's uh, how each of these algorithms uh, is scoring uh, the molecular pairs uh, so the scores distribution can be seen here uh, with orange uh, we can see all the labeled data whereas with light blue uh, all the unlabeled uh, we can observe uh, that um, the majority of uh, the labeled data the known data uh, get high scores whereas the blue data one part of the blue data uh, get high scores and can be regarded to belong in the same cluster uh, as the known ones uh, and the other one is taking lower scores and can be regarded as outliers and out outside of the known cluster and we tried to evaluate uh, each of these methodologies uh, using the true positive rate, rate uh, as we don't have negative uh, examples. We just um, scored um, a, its algorithm based on uh, how many times uh, it detected uh, the, known combina the known combinations of uh, a hidden part of uh, a k-fold as, um, as positive ones. So we can observe that uh, the deep uh, neural network um, has quite better accuracy and uh, the standard deviation is uh, quite low in comparison with the others. Uh, so that is why we decided to use that method for proceeding further uh, in our workflow. So now we have selected uh, the model we want to work with, uh, but uh, but we wanted to also to extract some physical meaning and don't use it as a black box. For that reason, uh, we tried to apply uh, one um, interpretability algorithm, which is uh, well established and called SAP, so SAP layer additive explanations. And it is based uh, on game theory and it's basically trying to calculate uh, the SAP layer values and try to find the feature contribution on the final score. So given the machine learning model and uh, the features and then the scoring, then by, by, by hiding some of the features, we want to see how each feature will affect the final score. And in that way, to try to uh, calculate which features had higher weight for giving that prediction uh, on the model. Uh, so if we rank uh, the weights of the features, uh, we can observe that those with, with high uh, values, with high supply values, uh, played an, a key role uh, for giving a high score to the predictions. Uh, as most of the dragon descriptors uh, are quite, um, uh, that cannot be under, are not very well uh, accessible, uh, we try to extract physical meaning by taking uh, the correlation uh, between the high scoring uh, dragon descriptors and some descriptors that have a, an easily understandable uh, physical meaning. Uh, so um, out of that, we uh, found out that our highly, um, highly weighted descriptors uh, are correlated with shape, size, polarity uh, and the electronic properties. So these were the descriptors that played a key role uh, in giving high scores uh, to the predictions. Um, if we want to see uh, the distribution of these descriptors uh, to our data, uh, we plotted these scatter plots. So on the first row, uh, we can see all the label data, so all the co-crystals that uh, exist in CCDC. And this is the distribution uh, of uh, the important uh, descriptors. So we can observe that there are two main areas. So the area uh, in which, uh, with the lower values of the descriptors, 
in which um, the molecules in the pair have similar uh, values, uh, whereas uh, there is another area in which uh, the molecules in the pair have very dissimilar um, values. So one molecule with uh, high polarity uh, is co-crystallizing with another molecule with low polarity. Uh, on the second row uh, is our unlabeled data set. So all the possible uh, molecular pairs that might exist and were exa exa extracted from Zinc-15. Uh, so the, uh, and they are um, colored with uh, blue, in, in blue. So this is all the unlabeled um, data. And the yellow ones uh, is the data that got high scores from the model. So we can see, we can observe that the model was able to extract the same patterns that exist in the known data, uh, and then given in high score and select this high scoring uh, the, um, the the data points uh, that follow the same trends, and to, that was like one um, way to to evaluate our model and see that okay our model indeed worked and indeed uh, extracted something important. Um, after that, we tried to observe the end uh, in uh, two, two dimensions. So using UMAP, uh, we projected the data set uh, in uh, the two dimensions uh, of, and plotting for uh, the important descriptors. So we can here again observe uh, these two areas, the one area uh, with uh, similar uh, descriptors and the one area with a larger gap and dissimilarity uh, in the descriptors. And uh, so that was quite important for driving further and uh, get some sense about why, what is important for co-crystallization and how a synthetic chemist uh, can work uh, with uh, this data and try to select uh, pairs to work with. So after finishing our machine learning model and having uh, a scoring for possible molecular pairs, then uh, we want to find the optimal ones. So which of them uh, have um, higher probability to have some electronic properties and to be tested? So to do that, uh, we um, did the Pareto front optimization. So we selected as uh, one of the molecules, pyrene, which was identified uh, as the uh, most popular from our scoring. So the combination with pyrene uh, was uh, scored quite high. So pyrene was a very popular co-former. And we used pyrene as one molecule. And then the second molecule uh, was selected based on its similarity to TCNQ, uh, which is quite famous uh, as um, uh, in conducting uh, co-crystals. Uh, so taking the, the Pareto front, uh, we identified uh, five molecules, four molecules that, that are on the Pareto front and one fifth, uh, which is um, close to the Pareto front, uh, to test experimentally. And then we also wanted to try an outlier. So a, co a pair that was predicted uh, as, um, an, as a pair that is not going to happen, we wanted to predict if indeed uh, this was not going to happen. So uh, taking uh, this uh, for the lab, uh, we tried to do some experiments. So the experimental work uh, screening was performed by Dr. Tana Angelos, and then the analysis of the structures uh, from Dr. Rebecca Vismara, which are two post, uh, postdocs uh, in my group. Uh, so we, among uh, the six uh, pairs we tried, uh, we managed to uh, make two new co-crystals uh, with uh, two co-formers that does not exist uh, in, CSD, in CSD yet. Uh, the pair that was predicted as an outlier was indeed an outlier, and we couldn't synthesize it. Uh, whereas uh, the three, four, and five uh, didn't form a co-crystal, but we observed that there were some problems with solubility uh, of these molecules, and it was not uh, so easily so easy to um, get soluble and form a co-crystal. So it was like a synthetic uh, procedure uh, error. So this was the whole process, and of course the idea is to give feedback to the database and close the loop and um, uh, work all, all, and all these um, components to work uh, synergetically. And um, so now uh, we want to try and put all this process to an application so that it will be free and any chemist uh, can use it. So we, we want to integrate it in a continuous workflow. Uh, and then try to extend our data set, including C60 co-crystals, uh, or try to optimize based on uh, other electronic uh, consideration as well. And then to make an app that any, any chemist can go and screen and uh, see what kind of um, combinations are, are suggested based on uh, this workflow. 
And now, uh, to summarize, uh, we used uh, two-dimensional descriptors and we managed to predict some interesting molecular pairs uh, and extract some physical meaning from for the co-crystallization. Uh, then we found out that the more descriptors and relationship uh, we can extract, then we get the more reliable results using the deep uh, uh, learning approach. And uh, of course, it's not always easy to connect uh, machine learning with experiment because there are some parameters uh, that cannot be considered, such as solubility. And my future work now uh, is to build uh, an application that uh, can be more widely used uh, and then maybe to find a way to um, directly predict uh, electronic mater materials uh, with, so to combine the machine learning with, with the optimization part uh, to, uh, to, see, to predict uh, uh, materials with electronic properties directly. So yes, that was my project. And uh, thank you for your attention. Then I have to take questions or um, comments. Yeah, lovely. So, are there any questions uh, for Katarina there? Hello. Yeah, I have one. Mm -hmm. Far away. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, first of all, thank you for your uh, presentation. It was very interesting, especially because I think. Uh, the lack of negative examples is a big challenge when uh, trying to apply machine learning to chemistry. Uh, and my question is, uh, well, when you were implementing the one-class uh, algorithms, uh, mm -hmm. do all of them come from a library that already exists, or did you implement it like from scratch? Uh, so yes, there is a, a library uh, which is um... Fired library uh, where the majority of them uh, are there, so they have gathered uh, all the algorithms. Uh, I also uh, picked one from SKLearn, the Gaussian mixture model, models, and mm -hmm. so yeah, this is from the, for the standard algor algorithms. And then the deep uh, neural network uh, is a separate paper from um, deep learning, deep one class. Okay, thank you. So I, I tried to select um, uh, categories that are different uh, between them, so and are, are, are like uh, based in different concepts to have an overall uh, idea of what's going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Anyone else? Okay, I, I have one, which is a naive question, which uh, I don't know. What, what is the McGowan volume? What is uh, the Magam volume? Uh, yeah, it is uh, like it's sizing like the, the shape, uh, the, the shape and size of, of the molecule. So uh, I don't. It's like a, 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 a certain type. So it, it takes into account uh, the I think the, the the rings, how many rings are in the structure, and uh, divides it with uh, uh, the. the Perimeters. I, I'm not. Yes, I'm not. I'm not exactly sure how it's the um, equation. Okay. Okay. So it's. I just, it's just not a script I've heard of before. That's all. So I'm intrigued to know. Um, anyway, any other questions? No. Good. Are you going to carry on and Ted do any um, testing of the compounds you found in terms of their electronic properties? Uh, you mean electronic of electronic properties? Um, I think yes, we will. Yes, we will try to yes to, to pick some or or maybe to pick some other types of uh, of new co-crystals uh, from the model and try them again for electronic properties. Yes, so this is the next step, but I'm not going to do that. So it's like the experimental uh, part. All right, you, 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 you can you can pass that one on to others. Okay, brilliant. Okay, um, so thank you very much, Katrina.